This is Tell Me What to Read, powered by Booktopia. I'm Nick Wasiliev, and today I'm joined uh, over the interwaves, over the Zoom, by the one and only Bo Miles. He's a YouTuber, award-winning filmmaker, poly jobist, speaker, writer, and self-described oddball. His book, The Backyard Adventurer, about meaningful and pointless expeditions, self-experiments, and the value of other people's junk, uh, came out recently, and it came in third place in this, this year's favourite Australian Book Award, which was run by Booktopia, which saw over 150,000 people come out to vote. Oh, welcome to tell me what to read, mate. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, that's, a, I mean, that's a false statistic of the quality of my book. It's an okay read, you know, I, I <laughs> certainly recommend it, but uh, I think that was, you know, we kind of flooded the airways for a week or two there to try and get votes and it was a bit of fun and, and I'm stoked that people voted I, and I've got been thanking them ever since because I can't believe the, uh, their loyalty to, um, I think we've got a few votes there of people that had no idea about the book, so good on them. <laughs> Yeah, well, look, it's it's. Thank you so much for coming on. It's a, it's a pleasure having you. And I know that you're a bloody busy man at the moment. You got uh, new barbers arrived. Backyard adventure is still going and going. We we still we're seeing it a lot. And you've obviously of course, of course got you know the bad river films. There's the new book which we'll we'll talk about in a bit. Are you doing all right? How are you? Yeah, life's really good. I mean, I, I've had my bum in honey for gee, 42 years now, but solidly, I think, I mean, the wife coming along in the last uh, five or six years, she's a, she's a breath of fresh air, really good home life. Yeah. Stupidly busy, but I kind of like it that way too. I think um, uh, I I just, yeah, I want to milk productivity in these productive years because uh, I mean, not that I believe in retirement. I think that's a furphy, but uh, yeah, I I love being busy and I love the sort of multiplicity of life. It's it's awesome. Uh, and yeah, a two and a half year old and a nine week old make things mighty busy. Indeed. Indeed. So take us back to this, this filmmaking journey, this, this entire journey, how the hell did, uh, did you manage to get to where you are now? How did that filmmaking journey start for you? Well, I'm not sure where I am right now, Nick. That's a good, (laughs) that's quite an existential question, but, uh, (laughs) I'm, if uh, Ricky Gervais said it really well when he sort of first uh, made his mark and became a sort of a global phenomena and, and a lot of, and, and he realized the formula that got him to that place. And a lot of people said, well, why didn't you roll out the formula earlier? He said, well, it took me 44 years to, to realize and to get that formula down pat. And I think I'm still doing that myself. I still don't think uh, the formula is set. Uh, mm. I've got a lot to learn still in the YouTube and writing world. Um one of the biggest pickups, Nick, with my my book, uh, The Backyard Adventurer, was uh, that I need to, for my second book, I need to write quite differently. Uh, when mm. I read it, particularly, so it did, we did the audio book too, and that picked up. Any bad sentence in that book, it picks up because you, I, you have to stumble over it. It's too long, too many words, too many adjectives. You, you're going for too much. It's too insightful. You repeat yourself from the paragraph earlier. So, yeah, I'm just, I'm just... Geez, mate, I'm still just a rookie at this filmmaking and writing game, but I love I love doing both things, and I think they're super complementary. So I essentially make films and then write books about the films and fill in the gaps, and I think it's a really good um, really good combo. You do definitely you know touch on some awesome stuff with your films and such, though. Like you, you're out there, you go out into the wilderness, and you and you show people things that you know, they don't see in there every day, you know, or in, more specifically, you encourage people to look at the, at, at, you know, their backyard in a brand new way. Um, you know, the res- I was, you know, seeing the response to the backyard adventure and, and the response that it got, what, what surprised you the most about, you know, all the folks who, who sent you a comment, sent you a message, said that they love the book. What, what was the, what surprised you the most about how people reacted to it? Uh, look, it was it was mostly positive, and and the beauty of that is that I think um, I, I really like the fact that people are positive, and that if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. I, I, and and look, there's plenty of reviews out there that aren't kind to the book too, but there's some truth to what they're saying also. So I really like the spectrum of feedback that's come back from it. I, what has always surprised me about my films and and the book and anything that I put out there into the public domain is that. Um, people are often quite inspired by what I say or write. And that really it's constantly surprised me because I'm just, I've never angled for that. And I just think what I do is just, I'm trying to be optimistic in life because I don't want to be a grizzle guts. It's just, it's far more uh, sustainable <laughs> to be 
and, and not happy. I'm not a big, big component or a big uh, proponent of being happy all the time. I think that's a suck on life, but I really do like the idea of being more optimistic with things because it, you just milk more out of it. Hmm. And I, I look, I think people get that because often people's lives aren't as probably rosy as mine and, and have as many opportunities as me. And they tend to see that sort of, sort of Steve Irwin optimism. And, and I'm happy to exploit that because it's an easier life that way. <laughs> it's well it definitely does you you do touch on a whole bunch of stuff with your adventures and things that you get up to you know you, you often talk about it in in a lot of your videos and 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 also in the book but for anyone who isn't you know familiar with the stuff that you get up to what's the thing that you really enjoy the most about you know going out and going on an adventure yeah i I don't, I think it's come from my parents. I've got a pretty, I've got, my father's a wacko artist and he sees, he, he's, he's excellent at seeing uh, a creative element or something interesting in anything. You know, he's the sort of bloke that would sit out the front of a store and watch the, the streetscape. He could, he could do it for hours. Mm. Uh, he's really good at seeing something in, in so-called nothing. And I, I've, I've certainly got that bug from him. But not, not always. I reckon I've had it for probably five or ten years when I'm really starting to realise that there's bang for buck in every scene, in every place, in every relationship. And so I really like to explore those things. And, and look, there's lots of dead ends, but that's cool too. A dead end is is you've learned something about a dead end. Uh, and so, and I don't want to be cliche about you learn from all your mistakes. I mean, we, we know all that, but I quite enjoy making mistakes and enjoy those dead ends as much as something that's a, a, a clearly amazing experience. So um, I guess, Nick, I just know that I'm bloody lucky that I see bang for buck in lots of situations and lots of things. And so uh, that's what I want to write about and make films about. Um, and yeah, like I said before too, people resonate with the idea. If I'm having a good time and if, if I'm really enjoying what I'm exploring, then it tends to rub off with the words or what I'm trying to create in the film. And so uh, that sort of sense of authenticity. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it, it absolutely comes through and it's gets, and you, you really get a sense of that because you're having fun, we're having fun, which is some, the thing that I always, whenever I've you know sat down and watched your videos, I can see this, this bloke, Bo is having the best time. Doing what well, he's that's doing. the idea. I mean, yeah. look, it's kind of the holy grail, isn't it? Like if yeah. uh, you can imagine yourself at school, um, if you if you had some sort of gravity towards you, and I didn't, I was a really underwhelming school person. I was really middle pack. I was never the popular kid. Uh, and but and yet I'm not now either, right? But there, but there's you, you're still trying to exploit whatever it is that you think others might like, and so. Um, and I don't say that with a great sense of ego, but that's just how humans operate. We're always trying to be our truest form of self that gets your best uh, impact with those you spend time around. And yeah, I, I think that's just, um, I think it's a great way. And look, I just think about it a lot, I suppose. I think about those elements and uh, I don't think people allow themselves to think that much. Yeah, it's it, having the chance to, to, to do that sort of thinking, do that sort of analysis, analysis and self examination I think is so important because it enables you to look at things in new ways and see things in new ways and whenever you do any of your adventures and fun stuff like you do it in a way that's that's quirky and fun as well like the first video that I had you know as an experience and it'll probably come as no surprise was the video of you cycling to to sign copies of your book you you, you <laughs> took it was it a bike or you took a bike and then you took a train you did a whole bunch of adventuring all around the place and then you stayed one night in a in I think it was a dry riverbed as well. Yeah, um, right next to the publishers. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> uh, sorry, the printers. Um, that's right, the printers. I, yeah. I, see that that's me showing my rookie book things. I've called publishers and printers the same thing for years, but they're very different. <laughs> uh, one prints books, and the other one is people that tell you what to write or what not to write. Uh, yeah, that was really great fun, um, and and just yeah, that was quirky and, and really enamored by something that's that was a little twenty four hour adventure and. And I tell you what, too, that was mighty hard. I thought I would stomp, you know, pre-signing 1,800 books. I thought, I've got this dialed, no problem. I'm going to do this in a couple of hours. It's going to be a piece of cake. But it was not. It was not easy. You know, yeah, it's, it's I actually think you, you see, having been in so many signings myself, you see all a myriad of, of reactions and people and focuses to, to it. I actually think it almost becomes like an existential, an examination of self because you're, you're in there, 
you're signing copy after copy after copy and then you're eventually like what the hell am i doing what's going on here it's all over the place well the only thing i can compare it to nick is that um one of my first jobs when i was 16 wasn't one of my first jobs it was one of my middle jobs you know i'd been working pretty since i was sort of 12 for pocket money or for paper rounds or whatever but when i was 16 i was on a potato harvester and the first half of the day so one of my jobs is and i was it was all women and myself and they were so much better than the job of me i had to pick out the clods the the bits of soil that were the same size as a, as a potato mm. and so mate after two hours i was i don't think i picked out a single piece of dirt it was just spuds i had no idea you know everything just molded into one and and i was demoted i was demoted off the harvester and i was put in the shed to do other stuff um and look it was much the same with the the signature thing in the end i was writing ben mill and and bon you know there was, there was a lot of people who got signatures out there that have nothing to do with me yeah, there is some, there, there's a lot of, it, they always, you always talk about the funny adventures that you go on with your book and everything around that. I'm, I'm not surprised you, you had such a funny experience with signing the book. Also, you mentioned earlier recording the audio book. Um, what was that experience like, uh, you know, looking back at your own words and seeing and, and putting it onto the, and actually translating it into an audio book? Well, I remember the first day, um, I was sweating bullets the first day. I mean, there's quite a <laughs> high pressure. Uh, and I remember I was talking to your colleagues during, through the process because was, I was under the pump to get it done in a certain amount of time. And for those of you who have never envisaged how this is done, and I certainly hadn't because I'm not a big audio book listener. I didn't know how long it would take. I was told, you know, I was advised that it was probably going to be around an eight to 10 hour book, which takes about 20 hours to read. And yep. so I'd been given four days to read the book and it ended up taking me six in the end because I just stuffed up so much, but you're doing it in a vacuum environment as well. So you're doing it in a studio that has no air coming in or out. It's very silent. You have to wear silent clothes. You can't wear anything that's like a Gore-Tex or a nylon. And, um, you know, so I, it was all right. So simple answer. It was very hard. I found it very hard <laughs> and like signing books, I thought I would nail it and I just didn't. <laughs> so it was freaking hard. <laughs> Yeah, I, it, it is such a, a strange experience then going and reading on the page and making sure everything is right to a T. For everyone who's listening, I'll, I'll include a link to it. Uh, I'll, I'll include a link to the audio book here and I'll also include a sneaky little snippet, um, which we'll include right here that you can, you can also check out. In the final furlong to home, mashed up in a cross-section of what I saw were ruminations on my so-called adventurous life, which is really an ongoing debate about my sense of perception. Back on the deck at home, half nude as I acclimatised from the heat and movement of running for three hours, I slowly ate chickpeas from the tin, which is a rare speed of eating for me. I'm thinking with scepticism about being an adventurer, engaging in daring and risky activities in unfamiliar places, often with only a hint of the expertise required to be there. Much like my wariness of real estate agents, I've seemed to gloss over the truth with half-truths, pitching stories as audacious, unable to see that so many other people do things tougher, riskier, more challenging, perhaps even more rewarding in far less publicised ways. There is truth to the idea that I like seeing what lurks in hard-to-reach places, and I might be plucky and enterprising, which fits the bill of adventure. But brave and heroic should never be keywords of my films, in my bio, or anything else associated to me. More than that, these bold terms of adventure should be questioned. I also want to ask you a little bit about uh, Bad River, uh, this this upcoming you know pro this series and uh, of like this film that you've been working on for quite a while. For folks who kind of aren't familiar, you've been you've been putting this together for a while. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I've kind of been a bit of a, a bootleg filmmaker my whole life nick i did it always as a hobby uh on the side of being a guide or as being an academic and so once that life has kind of come full circle and i'm no longer at a university and filmmaking is now my full-time game as, as well as writing um we decided to put in for a grant with screen australia so we got this big grant for uh, well a grant to make a, a, a four-part series where i go on adventure down or within the the unhealthiest rivers in australia and we'd pick the four unhealthiest rivers in Australia. 
the biggest, the oldest, the most urban, and the sickest in four different states around Australia. So off we go and we shoot these things and, and we bring them back. They've been really hard to tell the tales of bad rivers in Australia because they're, they're, they're somewhat based in negativity. And so it didn't occur to my pre-brain that I'm an optimistic kind of storyteller and I'm looking for the good threads in life. And here I am, I've gone off and done this thing that is very, in some respects, depressing and negative by nature. How the hell do I turn it into a story that is watchable and people aren't going to be depressed at the end of it? Because I don't want to be. I want to be still having a good time on these bad rivers. So how does it work? So they've been a, a real challenge to make. Um, anyway, we're at the sort of, I think we're at the start line of the finish line in a sense. So the, the first episode will go live this month at some stage, which is pretty exciting. You're the first to hear of that. We've kept it under wraps. And yeah, I'm writing the book about it as well. And that's, you know, that's getting close to being half done. And the manuscript of that will be done by the end of the year, well and truly, and pre-sales will go up, up and sale uh, in summertime. So the book and the film is about to be released of me off having adventures in the sickest waterways in Australia, which uh, I learned, I learned an awful lot. What did, what was, what were some of the things that, uh, that, I mean, it sounded like the whole experience, pardon the pun, was, it was all, was quite a fish out of water sort of experience for you was was there anything you know being the natural optimist that you are looking at you know these rivers and looking at everything around there that you went you know what uh you know there is there's hope for these places or there's there's things to look at you know realistic but optimistic well the thing with hope uh nick is that hope is for in a human context hope is is hinged on time so we always think in generations for hope in some respects because keeping things within our own lifetime makes sense because we can actually uh, enact or we can change that lifetime's worth of events. Something like a sick river is going to take multiple generations. So it's very hard to fathom, you know, the, so the sickest river in Australia is considered the Queen and King River in Tasmania. And we went and visited there and I, I had a couple of day adventuring this, this very sick river. I suppose you could fix it in my or your lifetime, but but I think it's going to take a lot longer than that. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, the landscape down there is millions and millions of years old, and yet we want to talk now, let's fix it in 10 years or let's fix it in 20. It's probably going to take a 1,000 years to sort itself out to get back to a status quo that it was before they mined there. Mm. And so, hope, yeah, hope's a funny thing in that I, I think, I, of course, hope exists because, of course, we could fix it, but it's just how long it takes. I, I mm. suppose. And I'm starting to understand that with these sorts of projects. Mm, mm. You mentioned as well that you've got a new book coming, the new book uh, that, that kind of is, you know, uh, done in, in collaboration with this, with this, with this uh, film series as well. Um, what are you going to be kind of, what are some of the things that you'll be examining and talk, talk, uh, touching on in terms of, you know, talking about that in the book? Well, my greatest failing as a writer is that I'm, pretty, I'm fairly self-centric and yet I think that's my greatest strength too. I'm very self-critical of myself within the humanity and as, as a so-called civilized animal. Uh, so I, I kind of put myself through the ringer in a sense that I know that I'm part of mining. I have copper in my pocket in my phone and I'm, I'm part of, you know, think of, look at the technology that makes our conversation possible right now with microphones mm. and computers and the internet and satellites and all sorts of remarkable things. And so I know that I'm very much part of these bad rivers. And so as I take myself through the journey of these rivers, I'm not only reflecting on myself, I'm trying to take that less seriously as well. I don't want to be just this doom and gloom dude. And it's not just about Bo either. It's about Bo's part in humanity and about how others uh, go about their world and how I observe that and how I, you know, I don't want to be just taking a, a critical lens to them, knowing too that I'm this flawed human. So I don't know. I try and take tangents that 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 still have meaning and still come back to the nucleus of these core stories. Uh, and so it's been challenging, but been really fun too. And I've found some sections kind of write themselves because it's so vivid and so visceral. It was the experiences, whereas some other aspects, I'm really having to push for a narrative to try and support my idea, um, which I imagine is a tension for most writers. <laughs> yeah absolutely um this book absolutely sounds amazing and so does this series and i'm i'm really really excited uh, to see when it comes out and the impact that it will have um if it's anything like some of the previous work you've done uh you know we should be in for something really really special 
I hope so, mate. I, I'm, I have no idea. And in fact, Mitch and I have been working on it all morning to get across our first fine cut, which is every, you know, every, every shot is in order and Screen Australia says, yep, bing, you can, you're good to go. And so that'll go off uh, tomorrow or Monday morning. Um, to be honest, Nick, I have no bloody idea anymore. I'm a bit like <laughs> when you get to the end of a book, you have no idea if it's any good anymore. You've been through the ring out. You, you're kind of half sick of it, but you're half proud of it as well. So I hope you're right, mate. You have not, yeah. When when you've been with your with this baby for a while, you lose all any sense of objectiveness. You're just like, so, I don't know who's going to see this. I don't know yeah, what's going to what's going to that, happen. That's exactly right. <laughs> um. So no. So as part of our show, we always like to encourage you know our listeners to to bring along books that they've been reading and enjoying as well. And I'm curious. Uh, I'm curious to hear uh, what has Bo Miles been been reading uh, over the last little while. So books, yeah. Look. I've found too, writing Bad River at the moment, yeah, and I'm writing it in between being a dad of this new person on the planet and being a filmmaker and, and whatever. And, and I've really enjoyed writing in 10 and 15 minute bursts and half an hour bursts. And I'm just wedging it in. And the beauty of the Bad River experiences is that they are so full on that I've got plenty to draw upon when I sit down and I can be in the, mo- I can be in the mode of a writer pretty quickly. Um, but I found what's helped it a lot too is that I've been reading a whole bunch in and around my life as well. And, and I didn't do this with the backyard adventure. I just tried to write. I thought, why would I read and waste my precious writing time while reading? Whereas now I'm doing this complimentary thing where, yeah, I've just read um, a couple of books in, in, over the last sort of few months, which was uh, Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne mm-hmm. and uh, Happy Isles of Oceania. Uh by Thoreau. So, uh, you know, I think we're by Paul Thoreau. So these two books, they're such brilliant travel books and I've been meaning to read them for ages and they're just, they're so good to, for me to read whilst I'm writing myself. Yeah. And I love that you're going for classics, like, uh, you know, cause these books have been around for, for donkey's ears. And so, you know, people have had many different perspectives on them, views on them. Do you think looking at, you know, how, you know, with all the adventuring you've been doing, for example, do you look at a book like Around the World in 80 Days and go, they get it. They get that, that, that spirit of, fe- of feeling of optimism or that sense of wonder that you might get whenever you, for example, go out into, into the country and, and go adventuring or go on, or go on your adventures? I think, I think more so in a sense that um, I don't think I'm more or less a, an observer than anyone else on the planet. What they are, I mean, they're better writers than me, those two people i've just talked about they just, they're beautiful writers they can see a scene and write it in many different ways i think i can only write it in a few ways maybe you know and i'll write it in a very bow centric way which is in some respects quite predictable whereas i think i read those works like that and i and i'm not sure what's going to happen next because they have such a labyrinth of ways to tell you what they've just seen or experienced or what they're imagining um you know, Paul Thoreau, he's, he's super critical. He's bloody critical. He just takes no prisoners. And that's, that's kind of liberating mm. too. It's bloody awesome. Whereas Jules Verne, he was kind of bonkers in his thinking all that time ago with that journey. Um, and I know that he half did it himself to, uh, to actually write that sort of travel log, but it, it just, just awesome. Just their, just their breadth of vocab, I suppose. Yeah, they they're abs- they are they're classics for a reason, and you always yeah always the, the way that they approach and look at things in in new and new week, unique ways continues just to inspire forever. I usually like to wrap up with some kind of fun you know quick fire questions, and I've got a plethora for you uh, you know to to finish up. Love it, right? first up, perfect idea. What's a perfect idea of a night with a book for you? I thought you were going to say, what's your perfect date? And I'm going, oh, that's interesting because I, I wouldn't know. But this is kind of, okay, so perfect night with a book. Is that what the question was? Yeah, perfect, perfect night with a book for you. Um, a cabin, an alpine cabin with soft snow on the outside. It's pretty cliche, but I have done this before because it is so beautiful. Um, I, I've lived in snow climates before as opposed to rain climates in the winter and snow just beats it every time because of its softness and its, and its bitter coldness. Uh, it's it's more silent and it just feels like it's a bit more enveloping. It's like a bloody big blanket, a cold blanket. So yeah, an alpine hut somewhere with an open fire. Uh, and I haven't had a glass of wine for a couple of months now. I'm on a bit of a a bit of a um, a non-alcoholic binge. Uh, but that <laughs> sounds real good. I'd have a bottle of wine there for sure. 
Oh, it sounds absolutely amazing. For me, that's just, that's goals. That uh, just kind of having that, that space away, quiet with a nice, you know, glass of wine. And it's a bit, it's a bit predictable, but it's predictable for a reason. You know, yeah. often, often things that people do like are, are for a reason that a lot of us like it. You know, Margot Robbie's very attractive to a lot of people for a lot of reasons. And so, <laughs> so is a bloody Alpine hut with a bottle of wine. Amen to that. On the subject of that, if you could go into any wilderness, in the world to film where would it be and what would you want to film about uh look i I suppose you know sticking with a predictable theme um i read uh in the heart of not the heart of darkness by conrad uh something about darkness it was an excellent book I, i feel ashamed i can't tell you the name of the book but it was about pizarro in the 1500s his first descent of the amazons in 1542 i think it was the amazons does fascinate me big time because of its size because of the uh unique wildlife there and the and the weird animals you know we're we're very sport for weird animals in australia but we don't have anything like the amazon Mm -hmm. that that kind of you know when you could be taken over by bloody ants and it was and it was a brilliant book um and so i'm very keen to see the mouth the mouth of the amazons is is 100 miles wide i mean that's amazing Mm. the fact that the mouth of a river is that big it's like a sea itself so um i would love to see the amazons and i say the amazons too because i think that's a bit of a, a new age thing there are so many rivers there's not just one river it's 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 kind of the watershed yeah yeah on the fact that like you can be you know how many miles offshore and you can you know get some water and it's still clear it's still clear enough to drink because the amount of water that's coming out of the mouth of the amazon is just so much oh, it goes out for yeah it goes out for hundreds of kilometers i, I paddled yeah. in africa when i paddled from mozambique to cape town i paddled through the limpopo river which comes out uh south of mozambique near near the top of south africa and that was the same for for 30 k's i was paddling in brown water with uh sharks everywhere and with and with (laughs) floating stuff from the river that was way inland you know so incredible mushroom cloud of of river water it was amazing Mm. yeah absolutely on the subject of you know adventures and also previous films and stuff that you've done you know i feel like this is going to be an impossible question do you have a favorite shot like you film something and you've looked back at it and you're editing and you're like, Jesus, that looks amazing. What I just captured there. Yeah. Drones are pretty incredible these days. And yet I'm going to go to a very easy one for me to talk to because it was, it was during a really long crossing on Bass Strait. So there's the largest crossing of Bass Strait when you paddle via uh, one of the Island groups is about a 65 kilometer crossing. Now, when you take into account, tides and coming in and out of bays we, we paddled almost 90 kilometers that day to get across to flinders island and as sun was setting that day we thought we'd be there by now but we still had three or four hours of paddling to do in the pitch dark mm. um the, the sunset was you know everything stilled off which is very classic for for the end of the day when the wind abates finally uh and it did and it was just it was this massive big uh rainbow now, you know, we've seen plenty of rainbows before, but when you do it, when you see one at the end of the day, when you realise that daylight is ending and you are not where you are supposed to be and and yet it is just magnificent, it was really a special, mo- a very sublime moment. Mm. Oh, that sounds absolutely amazing. And, that, and it's on film. So I think it's episode three of my Bass by Kayak series. I'll include a link to it so everyone everyone can check it out. Um. What's the funniest kind of behind the scenes moment you've had when filming? So that could be, you know, you're out, you're, you're walking along a, a, lo- a road, you're in bushland, you're out at sea. What's the, what's the one moment that you've gone, what the hell's going on here? Oh, I've had so many. I mean, it, it comes to mind. And I, the only reason this comes to mind is because I told this story yesterday to someone. Uh, it was, it was about, it was back in Africa actually, because the reason I remember uh, any kind of humorous or in, incredible uh, moment in Africa was because in many respects, I was sort of locked. It was a really hard, it was a hard expedition, hundred odd days expeditioning and probably only five or 10 days that were really quite pleasurable. The rest was just bloody grunt work. It was really tough, hard work, but I'd gotten into this place called Sedwana Bay after a month or two of paddling and within 15, 20 minutes, I'd met an Australian and there was an instant connection with an Australian and I was still in all my sea kayaking stuff. I had my I was salt all over me. I was all crusty. 
And I needed to go into town to get groceries. I needed to resupply my kayak and, and me. Uh, and he said, look, th- there's, a, there's a bread van over there. The Chinese guy who owns it, he's not in town. Um, you can take his bread van. You will, however, have to pick everyone up on the way into town on, on the way back, though. So if anyone's got their thumb out or on the side of the road, you got to pick them up because that's what the bread man does. So here I am in my full kayak and get with my PFD still on. I still got salt dripping off me. I'm in my wet booties and I'm driving into town uh, to get groceries in a place I've never been. will never go, probably never go again, picking up all these people on the side of the road in a little mini truck, get my groceries. And it was just a really, it was an incredible um, little couple of hours of life and none of it's on film. <laughs> I didn't film a thing of it because I thought, you know, and I regret not filming such a thing, but they're really special moments. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, swag or tent? Uh, gee, I mean, I'd go, look, if I've got to pick one, I'd go swag. I think they're, I think they're great. Oh, love it. And then the last classic question, we always finish by asking, you're stuck on a desert island, uh, and what books do you take with you while you await rescue? Because I'm talking to you. I'm instead going to ask, you're stuck on a deserted island and while you're away rescue, you get to take any sort of survival item with you. What items do you take with you? I've got, I've got, I've got a knife in my hand. I mean, that's too, a bit cliche. I'm just going to take a massive unlimited bag of licorice. That's what I'm going to take. <laughs> because the things I can do on a bag of licorice, you know, in terms of running, you know, creativity, happiness, you know, you eat, I can eat it slowly and I'm very rarely disciplined enough to eat slowly. So a bag of licorice, but I would take, I, I'm going to give you a book anyway. I'm going to give you Walden um, because I just think it's bloody beautiful. I can't believe it was written hundreds of years ago. You feel like a hipster wrote it last year. You know, it's a really <laughs> topical, cool book. I love it. I love it. And I love that you're taking a book with you and a large bag of licorice. <laughs> That's it. Survival. <laughs> I could honestly talk to you all day, but unfortunately we have run out of time. Bo, thank you so much for, for coming on. Tell me what to read. It's been a pleasure chatting to you. Good on you, Nick. Thank you, mate. So for all of our listeners, you can buy any books mentioned today right now in the description from booktopia.com.au. And of course, I'll include links to books uh, to Bo's book, The Backyard Adventurer, which is in the description as well, and you can check out below. We'll catch you on Thursday for our next episode. But until then, thanks for listening and never stop reading.